brother! Oh man, you guys, we are just weeks away from the live action Avatar series dropping on Netflix, and I could not be more hyped. The trailers just look absolutely amazing and faithful to the original, but also seem to hint that like maybe we're gonna get some additional story beats along the way, maybe? Like normally we don't get to meet Azula or Fire Lord Ozai outside of cameos or shadows until season two and three respectively, but they'll both be in the first season now, so yay! Also, we're gonna get to see like Sozin, the guy who, you know, started the war like with Sozin's comet, actually attack the Air Nomads, which I honestly never imagined him partaking in the battle. I just thought he like sent troops in, so like already that just reframes him in my head. Either way though, with just so much bending action in our near future, I thought it might be a fun and good idea to just go examine each bending style and the secret bending techniques each element has to its name, often known as sub-bending. Think metal, lava, lightning. These are all the techniques that, despite the long-standing nature of bending in general, have either only been recently discovered or just rarely mastered due to the overwhelming difficulty, even by the avatars. Which I always find really interesting because it's normally these techniques that give any single element bender some kind of level playing field whenever they're going up against the avatar, or, you know, at least as level as you could hope to be. They are literal forces of nature, so, you know. Good luck. But without any further ado, let's Sky Bison dive into the world of Avatar and unlock the secrets of each element. So before we begin, I think it's probably worth noting about sub-bending styles that the show often presents them as if only a select few benders can do them, but that's not true. Any bender could learn any of these techniques, it's just that for daily life, most of them are too niche to be useful and the level of mastery required for them is way too high, but they are not like genetically selective, anyone could learn them. But with that said, let's kick things off with earth bending, since its sub bending techniques easily get the most screen time and are the most prominent ones on the shows. The technique that probably comes to mind first for most sub bending is metal bending, the ability to not just bend the earth itself, but the trace materials of earth inside of a processed metal. This technique is famously invented by Toph Beifong, who uses it to free herself from a metal prison and just goes on to wreck havoc amongst the Fire Nation. Then, Post-war, she even founds her own school, the Beifong Metal Bending Academy, to start sharing her knowledge with the next generation of earthbenders, and her techniques are so effective that the entire Republic City police force largely depends on metal bending, and then an entire city, Zalfu, is built around the concept of metal bending and largely inhabited by just metal benders. Imagine that, you discover a technique and an entire city is built around that technique. Meanwhile, you personally are off living in a swamp, just sort of, you know, complaining about everything. But I can't stand you being so pathetic and getting your butt kicked all the time. But what I think is so interesting about metal bending is that it technically always existed, but it was just unable to be discovered until metal became a prominent enough resource for earthbenders to really experiment with it. But it's also full circle because the discovery of metal bending is actually delayed by the Hundred Year War, because while metal is pretty abundant in the show, it's mainly used by the Fire Nation, who is the most adept at creating it because of their fire bending. Because they have so much metal, they have much more advanced weaponry, which gives them that extra edge in battle, even though it's still taking them hundred years to get basically nowhere. But even the very idea of metal bending is so foreign to earthbenders that it is impossible. The Fire Nation is shipping earthbenders to sea and putting them on metal islands, certain that they're removing them from their bending, which really they were, because even the earthbenders didn't consider it possible. The reason Toph is able to discover it at all is because she first mastered a different earth subbending type seismic sense. This is basically sonar for earthbenders and allows them to perceive anything near them that is touching the earth with a detailed vision in their head. And most earthbenders just don't consider this a necessary skill because, you know, they can just see with their eyes, but Toph is blind, so she has to rely on this at almost all times, and the advantage it offers her is obvious, as even as just a little girl, she's basically the most powerful earthbender of alive. I am the greatest earthbender in the world. Don't you two dunderheads ever forget it. 
And it's not just good for fighting either. Toph can also use it as a lie detector by tracking someone's heart rate and breathing through the earth. And it is her mastery of the seismic sense that clues her into the trace amounts of earth in metal and lets her bend that as well. Worth noting, however, that there are such a thing as pure metals that have no earth in them, like platinum, and in that case, they can't be bent. And then there's earth final substyle, lava bending, which you might first think of as a fire bending tactic, but no, since it's molten rock, it's actually an earth bending technique. And actually, I'll be honest, prior to Legend of Korra, when Gaizan and Bo Lin used the skill, I definitely thought it was like an avatar only technique that combined earth and fire, since we actually do see Avatar Zito, Kyoshi, and Roku use it. But alas, Earwax, no, it's just a rare earthbending style that allows the bender to change lava to rock, rock to lava, or my personal favorite, lava to ninja star. While we're on the topic of lava though, let's move on to fire and its sub-bending styles, lightning and combustion bending. So in the main show, lightning bending is the signature move of Azula, who nearly, or actually, I don't know, kills Aang with it by the end of season two. What do you think? Does he actually die? Let me know in the comments. Lightning generation is very difficult and requires inner peace and absence of emotion. But if a firebender can achieve that state, then they can separate their positive and negative electric potential, let them build up and then bring them crashing back together, which creates the lightning blast. Personally, I always found it really interesting that in Last Airbender, this ability is so rare that only Iroh, Azula, and Ozai can use it, but then by the time of Korra, it's common enough that the Lightning Benders are able to generate enough energy to power, like, all of Republic City. And before I say it, no, Zuko never lightning bends. He does successfully redirect it, but he personally does not ever generate lightning, okay? But I feel like the widespread use of lightning bending is similar to how metal bending doesn't become widespread use. Again, it's because of the Hundred Year War. Because during that time period, the royal family just keeps its most powerful bending secrets to itself, but then post-war, the information is much more available and the people are able to put it use outside of just combat. Then there's combustion bending, a sort of telekinetic style of fire bending that firebenders use by focusing their chi through their forehead before blasting it out in these like super straight explosive lines. And in case you're wondering about like the third eye thing, that doesn't like come with it. It's just sort of like a thing people who can combustion men often put on their forehead, which if you ask me, seems like a bad strategic move. It like signals what you're gonna do, but whatever, you know, you, you be you. It doesn't seem like you have much challengers because you can just, you know, blow them up, I guess, whatever. Either way, combustion bending is wildly destructive and makes it very difficult for anyone to get near you, but it is also highly dangerous because it requires your chi to flow with no interruption at all. Even a mild distraction could cause just like the air in front of you to explode, while if you were to like be hit directly in the forehead while you're blasting, it could cause the explosion to happen inside your head, which would, you know, be fatal. Or, you know, alternatively, someone could just, you know, wrap a metal helmet around your face as you shoot and, well, then, yeah, also, also still fatal. But, hey, on that note, let's move on to the airbending subtypes because Please Death There actually unlocks one of the airbending subtypes of flight for Zaheer. Airbending, hands down, has the most difficult to master subtypes of flight and spiritual projection. In fact, in all of history, only two known airbenders, Guru Lahima and Zaheer, have achieved flight, which is not to be confused with what like Aang is doing with his glider. Like, yes, he is flying, but he couldn't do it without the glider. I guess also you should count like all sky bison as well, because they, they can they can just do this. Flight is truly the ultimate airbending technique, though, where one becomes like weightless or one with the wind. Empty and become wind. It's achieved by letting go of all of your earthly attachments and desires. So the reason Zaheer can suddenly fly after Plea's death is because he's in love with her, but after she dies, he has no more earthly attachments and can finally become one with the wind. 
Aang, on the other hand, has like lots of earthly attachments and has a really hard time letting them go, which is why he never unlocks this power. But I hear you, you might be thinking like, well now wait a minute, like Azula kind of flies with fire and Aang can fly with like a little tornado beneath him. So like really, what what's the difference? Is this that good of a technique? The answer is yes, it is way better because this kind of flight is passive and requires no energy. It's like to the point where Guru Lahima spent the last 40 years of his life without ever touching the ground, even in sleep. Okay, I said Aang never unlocked this, but personally, I would argue that maybe right here for just a couple of seconds, Aang is slime because what he does is he goes in that little shell and is like forced to let go of all of his earthly attachments so he can re-enter the avatar state. I'm sorry, Katara. So like, yes, there's this energy beam around him, but I think if like five more seconds passed, that would have gone away and he would have just been flying. But instead, you know, Azula just sort of like zap slaps him to the ground and conquers bossing say so we, we we don't really get to know for for sure but i think it's possible ang was flying for like a few seconds despite ang's total failures as an airbender his granddaughter janora is one of the few benders to ever achieve the other airbending substyle of spiritual projection Airbenders different from other benders in that their bending requires constant spiritual awareness and as a result airbending culture is very spiritual in nature. At no point is this connection more evident than in the hands of a true master who can project their spirit form from their physical body and explore the world around them with true freedom meaning they can float, they can pass through physical objects, even water. You can even use this to locate people you have a strong connection with. Janora's so good at that. I think she helps Korra like refuse with Rava and continue the entire Avatar cycle. I don't, I don't know, the end of season two gets kind of weird. It's a real low point, but Janora's awesome. But that just leaves us with water and its subbending styles of healing, spirit, and blood. Although, for water, I would argue that ice should count as a subbending style as well. I mean, like, lava is to earth as water is to ice. Yes? I think the only real delineation here is that ice bending is just so common and so widespread and heavily adopted that it is sort of transcended the status of a sub bending technique and is just now considered you know regular old water bending either way the first true sub style is healing which water benders can do by learning how to use the life-giving properties of water to heal certain kinds of wounds relieve mental strain and even detect blocked flows of chi however it does have its limitations like it can't totally heal scars or heal birth defects like Toph's blindness, and even though it can detect block chi, it can't unblock the chi. And depending on the water you're using, you might be capable of different things. Like for example, the water from the Spirit Oasis is able to heal Aang's lightning wounds in a way that regular water would not have been able to. That's why I do think he died and why the Spirit Oasis water was so important because it was like, yeah, you, we need this special water to do this thing right here, right now. Healing also sort of stands on its own as one of the subbending styles that has its own subbending skill set of spirit bending, not to be confused with energy bending, which is an avatar only thing, but spirit bending allows a waterbender to instill balance or upset the balance of an angry spirit, which is a technique mostly used by Korra and Unalak back in that like season two, section two. So if you forgot about that one, it's not really a big deal. But that brings us to our final style, the dark side of water bending, known as blood bending. This is hands down the most dangerous technique of any bending style at all. And it is like proper scary. Basically waterbenders will use their bending to control the blood in another being's body and force them to do whatever they want. It was invented by this creepy old lady named Hama who used it to escape the Fire Nation and then went on to teach Katara how to do it. And at that time, for the most part, the ability was only usable during the full moon. But then one generation later, the crime lord Yakone taught his two sons, Amon and Tarlock, how to use it 
any time they saw fit, and Amon in particular pushed the limits of bloodbending much further than Hama ever did. He got to the point where, similar to like the telekinetic nature of combustion bending, he could control others almost psychically with little actual movement needed on his part. And he could use bloodbending to sever others' chi paths, effectively taking away their bending. And you'd think like, oh, could you then use blood bending to undo it? But no, you could not. The only known cure for such a thing was for the avatar themselves to use their energy bending to restore your pathways, to get your bending back. So, I mean, Korra is just really lucky that Aang met that lion turtle in the series finale. Like, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> But there you go guys, that is every sub-bending technique that we know about so far, although I'd be super curious to see if they introduce any new ones in the live action show, that would be really cool. My question for you guys though is, what other sub-bending styles do you think exist out there? Like, if blood bending works by water bending, controlling the water in your blood, like, there's air in your blood too, right? Like, shouldn't air bending have its own version of that, or like, shouldn't air be able to control like the air in water or like oxygen makes fire right so air should be able to make bigger fires like I, it seems like there's a lot of potential with air bending in particular because air is just so everywhere and a part of so many things either way guys thank you so much for watching don't forget to like the video if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future avatar action from us if you'd like to see why azula's fire is blue you can check out this video right here but otherwise until next time ben i will see you in another life brother